Good evening and welcome to the urban.co.uk and National Landlord Association webinar on deposit legislation and procedure. This is a topic that many of you have asked us to cover, so we've hooked up with the team at My Deposits, one of the largest deposit protection schemes in the UK, who offer custodial and insurance based schemes to answer some of our questions. We'll be talking about legislation, custodial versus insurance based schemes and general procedure, and then, as it's such a large topic, dispute resolution in a subsequent webinar. I'd like to welcome Susie Hirschman from My Deposits, who will be taking today's webinar. Susie, thank you for joining us today. And can you tell us a bit about My Deposits and what you do at My Deposits, please? Yes, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, my, my role has uh, changed and evolved uh, together with the scheme, which has been in place since 2007. Um, I now am Head of Dispute Resolution here at My Deposits and I run a lot of webinars, I, I deal with a lot of the educational side of things, I write a lot of guidance which can be found on our website and which probably we can refer to as we go through the webinar itself. Okay, thank you. So, shall we start at the beginning? What is a deposit scheme and, and as a landlord, do I, do I have to use one? Um, you don't have to use a deposit scheme if you do not take a deposit. But quite simply, if you take a deposit, the law says that since April 2007, you have to protect that deposit with one of the three schemes. Okay, and um, if I choose not to and I still take a deposit, um, what, are the, what are the potential penalties? Um, at the end of the tenancy, the tenant has a choice, or at, at any point actually during the tenancy, the tenant has a choice of taking the landlord to court. Now, the Small Claims Court um, have seen quite a few cases go through. Uh, the law has changed since 2007, and the, it was a very strict three times the deposit penalty, um, plus the deposit returned to the tenant at the end of the tenancy. Um, as I just said, the, the law has changed, and now the courts have the discretion to apply between one and three times the deposit as a penalty to, for the landlord not complying with the law. Okay, so can I can I take the can I use a scheme myself or do I have to go through an agent in order to in order to use a scheme? Um, you can do it yourself. There is no problem doing that. It's very easy to use. The scheme um, website is allows you to do it all online at any time of the day or night. Um, if you if you choose to use an agent because you're you're paying them to manage your property or to let only then they can offer that service I'm sure you'll need to check with your agent though if that's your choice okay and uh, we, we hear it a lot a lot of landlords say well I can I can get around um, the deposit schemes I can control it myself because what I do is I just take a, an extra month's rent up front does that does that work that's a pretty legal issue and you're treading a very fine line if that's what you choose to do you've got to bear in mind that if you are taking the rent, an extra month's rent, which might be equivalent to what you would expect the tenant to pay in the last month, and never intending to return that money to the tenant, you can, but the danger you're opening yourself up to there will be that you have no money left for any dilapidations. If you intend to refund that extra month's rent, and that's what you're calling it, the courts have taken a very dim view of that and, and actually labelled it a deposit. It doesn't matter what you label it as. If you intend to refund it, it is a deposit. So be very careful. So I suppose what we're saying, that if it's an, an extra month's rent, that money can only be used for rent. Um, and if you try to use it for anything else, then, then you put yourself at risk of, of, being, of labelling it as a deposit and falling into um, penalties. If, Precisely. I think that's a very simple, you know, that, look at it that simply and you probably can't go wrong. So rent is rent is the answer to that question, I yes. suppose. Yes, yes. Good okay. question though. Okay, so moving on to custodial versus uh, insurance-based schemes. So what's the actual difference? Okay, well, quite simply, um, a custodial is just that from a scheme's perspective. A custodial protection will be where the landlord or agent takes the deposit from the tenant and literally sends the whole lot to the scheme who holds it um, on their behalf for the duration of the tenancy. And then at the end of the tenancy, both parties have to um, interact with the scheme to agree in what proportion the deposit goes back to the tenant or deductions are made. 
With the insurance scheme, again, the landlord or the agent take a deposit from the tenant and hold onto that deposit and pay the scheme a protection fee. Um, that, that's a very simple way of, of looking at the difference between the two. Okay, so uh, the first reaction that we often get from landlords um, when, when explaining the difference between the insurance and the custodial scheme mm-hmm. is, oh, well, let's forget the custodial scheme, I, want, I, I get to keep the money <laughs> yes. um, if I get more control um, and I can utilise the funds if I use an insurance scheme, I just have to pay a nominal fee and, and it's, it's as it always was. Is that, is that, is that the case? Um, that's a very interesting question and from a, from a strict legal perspective, the best, the best answer is no, you shouldn't use that money, it's not your money to use. Mm-hmm. The default position is that the deposit, whoever is holding it, belongs to the tenant. So it should be kept aside for the duration of the tenancy. Um, in practice, there's very little regulation over landlords and what they do with that deposit, so we are not in a position to know exactly how and what processes landlords use in their own individual practice. Is it, is it good practice to segregate those funds, or is it actually required to segregate those funds? No, if you're a landlord, there is no requirement. Okay. That's what I'm saying. There is no regulation on the landlords. If you're an agent, there absolutely is. Okay. Um, so does it give me more control at the end of the tenancy if I if I use because um, if if it's in a custodial scheme then it's it's down to you guys if how much I do or don't give back if it's an insurance scheme um, do I have more control over that because I've got the money okay so so with the custodial scheme the landlord and the tenant or the agent and the tenant will agree or disagree at the end of the tenancy on on the dis- distribution of the deposit but they both have to contact the scheme to say this is what has been agreed and then the scheme actually because they hold the money have to distribute the funds. Mm -hmm. With the insurance scheme a landlord or an agent has much quicker control of what happens at the end of the tenancy. It can actually go back to the tenant on the same day if there's no dispute or if the tenant agrees to £50 for cleaning the rest of it he gets back within a day or two and, and the schemes don't get involved. The schemes will only get involved with the insurance protection if there is a dispute at the end of the tenancy. So that's it. So it's much quicker. Okay. So if, if there is a disputed amount of, say, £200, um, does the landlord get to hold on to that £200 um, or do they have to submit it somewhere? Um, if the tenant, the tenant has to, would have to um, raise a dispute with the scheme and then the landlord is asked to remit the disputed amount to us, and best practice is to then send the tenant anything that's left that isn't disputed. Right. So the schemes are only dealing with the dispute. So in terms of the difference um, of control of funds, if there is a dispute, you still have to give the cash over to the scheme. So it's, it's not like you can just say, well, my decision is to keep it. Um, I, I don't agree. Um, you still have to submit those funds. Yes. Historically, we saw a lot of that reaction. Mm. Um, I think landlords now are much wiser, they're much more aware of what they have to do if there is a dispute. Uh, They still don't like it necessarily, but at the end of the day that is the process they have to follow. They have to submit it to the scheme. Okay, so insurance versus custodial. Insurance can can mean that you, you get quicker resolutions, but in terms of the control of the funds, the in at the end of the day it's pretty much the same as custodial. Um, yes, it's just quicker. That's okay. it. Good. The only difference. Okay, so moving on to procedure. What is the um, exact procedure that a landlord has to follow uh, when setting up a deposit? Well, if he's a new landlord and hasn't prote- um, hasn't set himself up with one of the schemes um, already, he will need to join one of the schemes. Um, and it's really important to understand that joining a scheme doesn't mean you are protecting that deposit so it's two separate processes you first have to join the scheme and then when you start your tenancy and you take that deposit you have to protect it within that 30 days that the law requires okay so what does protection actually involve Okay, so this is a two-stage process um, and it's very prescribed by the housing act the landlord has to protect the deposit um, within 30 days of receiving it. 
and then he has to send to the tenant within the same 30 days what we call the prescribed information. Now, if you don't comply with both parts of that requirement, you are not complying with the law, so you are in breach. And we go back to those penalties that we discussed earlier of three times the amount. So it's really important to make sure you send that prescribed information as soon as you've protected that deposit for the tenant. So there's two steps. There's the actually doing it, and then there's the administration step. Um, yes. If it, uh, we find that a lot of landlords do it um, and then forget the administration step, is the, are the penalties the same, or, or is, is there more lenience if you forget the administration step? Um, well, I, I'm not a judge. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, let's get that straight. Um, I, I'm not in a position to say, well, I, I think the way that the law looks at it now, it's a little bit less strict than it was initially, which was a flat three times the amount of deposit for mm -hmm. failing to, to comply with the law. Now, if a judge can see that the landlord thinks he's done the right thing and ha he has made every effort to do that, they have that discretion. But that doesn't mean that they won't still apply three times the amount of the deposit as a penalty. The, so it, it's very straightforward. It is a two-stage process. You have to comply with both of them to comply with the law. Yep, and, and I think one thing that we do see is that if you don't send the uh, prescribed information within the 30 days, I, I think it's a certainty that your Section 21 rights um, would be affected. You wouldn't be able to serve a Section 21 notice, and if you did and it went to court, it's, it's unlikely that you'd be successful um, in, in the um, eviction of the tenant. So why don't you, as a scheme, um, complete the task and send the uh, prescribed information for the landlord? Um, the Housing Act 2004 um, said it actually makes it quite clear that it's the landlord's responsibility. So uh, in, and m the main reason for that is probably because the tenant is expected to sign the prescribed information when he gets it which is acknowledging receipts. So we don't, we don't send it, we leave it to the member. That We feel it's not our responsibility to take that on. Okay, so that's another interesting point. Um, it's, it's not just about signing, it's about gaining a signature on, on, from the tenant as well. Yes, that's best practice, to okay. actually make sure the tenant signs it. And uh, as, as, as an agency, Urban um, gets signatures for all our all our landlords. So we, when we have when we register a deposit, um, we will take the prescribed information um, and the um, and the certificate, and we will via electronic signatures we will gain signatures on the prescribed information, initialing each page, and have a document saying that they've received it. Um, so so we kind of go that extra mile to ensure that, that we've got all the proof that, that it has been prescribed. That's great. That's great practice. I mean, I wish everybody else was as organised as that. Brilliant. OK. Um, so we're having lots of questions come through at the moment. Um, the, the webinar so far has generated lots of different questions from, from the landlords. Um, so we're going to try and answer some of them. Um, we won't get to them all, unfortunately, but we're going, we have quite a few similar ones coming up. So we're going to try and tackle them now. Okay, so the first question we're getting a lot um, is what is um, the prescribed information? So what are the, the documents that I have to send? Okay, um, this will be the deposit protection certificate from the scheme. It will be the details of the scheme and under what circumstances uh, any deductions can be made from the deposit. And it, it also, I mean critically, going back again to repeat myself, it has to be sent within 30 days of the protection. How long do I have to advise the tenants if I want to make deductions at the end of the tenancy? Um, in theory, the, the tenant should be asking for their deposit back and then you have 10 days from that point um, to, to actually advise them that you are withholding a part or all of their deposit and, and for what reason. Um, in practice, I'm not sure that tenants are aware that they have to make that request before the 10 days start. So in best practice is to just count 10 days from the end of the tenancy and make sure that you're up to speed on what you want to do with that deposit. 
and, and if, keep and keep talking to your tenant. That's really important. Keep you know open open avenues. Start negotiating, um, and because everybody wants to move on at this point. And and if I do go over the ten days, will the scheme just say no? It's too late. Um, no, we're not there to actually enforce um, those that those time scales. That is just. Um, what is recommended I think actually and I would need to check that but I think it's actually legislation that that gives that 10 day rule but I'm happy to go away and check that for you okay what happens when my tenancy switches to a periodic tenancy from a fixed term okay well I mean basically nothing happens as such all that it does is that it rolls on generally in most cases it will be on a monthly basis a rolling monthly contract so your, your 12 month or your 6 month or your 18 month contract is finished but it rolls on on all the same terms as the old contract. Once you start to change those rules then you're not in a rolling periodic tenancy. Um, you, will, you will have started something new and that has its own consequences which probably today's webinar is not designed to deal with. Okay. But if someone has a question on that they, they should come back to you. So um, uh, another question we've got here is um, on inventories. A landlord has done an inventory, but he wasn't able to get the tenant to sign the inventory, and uh, it made the um, negotiation at the end of the tenancy really, really tough. Um, so how, how can landlords avoid that? Um, that's a really good question, actually. Um, when I talk to... Uh, when I go out and do workshops and talk to people about inventories um, there's lots of different ways that people practice making sure that tenant actually has sight of the inventory um, some people will print off two copies initially and get the tenant to sign one which is left with the agent or the landlord and then the tenant has usually best practice seven days to make any amends sign it and send it back that's the copy they have other um, people will send it to the tenant via email now from an adjudication perspective all we are looking for is the fact that the tenant has had the opportunity to look at that document and make any amends because we need some verification that they've actually seen it mm -hmm. you can't make a tenant look at it you can't make them sign it and you can't make them make any amends but as long as you can prove that the tenant had every opportunity to do all of that, then from an adjudication perspective, we're happy that that document is, is valid. Does using a, a third-party inventory provider add weight to the inventory? Um, in, on some level, it may do. Um, on a basic level, the answer is no. With, with the, the landlord or an agent inventory, we are really looking for that additional evidence by way of a tenant signature or the fact that he actually got that document to, to place full weight on it because potentially it's not as unbiased as that third party inventory company that you're talking about who are providing a service for both parties as a stakeholder right from the beginning they have no bias there's no potential bias there so the tenant signature while absolutely best practice um, or, or some way of proving that the tenant's been sent it is is necessary um it's not it is it is given it's given, the tenant signature is given less uh less weight it's not so important okay so the best best practice with inventory is really to get a third party inventory and get the tenant to sign it off um and then really you're you're fully protected in terms of um the inventory yes we could you could say that yes okay so what have landlords got to look forward to in the future um what legislation um is out there that's coming up that's not that's not arrived yet uh whew. um uh probably the most the three most important things that i've spotted uh well and, and i'm sure everyone else has recently will be the tenant fee ban so no fees can be taken from tenants anymore as far as letting uh, lettings go, but 
none of these none of these have been confirmed in terms of details yet and exactly what they mean um, as you will see uh, I mean that was one of the things that the uh, in the Queen's speech um, the other thing was that potentially only one month's rent can be taken as a deposit so there's no more six weeks or eight weeks um, and I think my top tip from that would be that remember that um, negotiation is key when it comes to the end of the tenancy and if you've suddenly only got one month's rent rather than your what you're used to now in terms of six weeks or eight weeks negotiation is going to be so important your ability to listen and talk to your tenant and to be reasonable and learn to compromise um, and and one thing that We'll, we'll probably talk about more in the next webinar will be something called fair wear and tear which you all probably are very aware of um, that you have to factor in when you're trying to make a deduction from your tenant so I hope that helps um, that's not, not by no means an exhaustive list of what's going on out there um, but I think it could be an ongoing but I think it could be an ongoing thing just to keep an eye out we have time for one more question and it's with regards to section 21 if I've forgotten to serve my prescribed information and I need to serve a section 21, what can I do? Well, I'll answer this one. If you do not send your prescribed information within the first 30 days, not only are you leaving yourself liable to fines, but a, but a tenant could use it as a defence against serving a section 21 in court. Section 21 is a no-fault notice, but you must have all your administration points in order otherwise a judge will throw it out however one option you do have is to return the deposit in full before serving the section 21 and then it would render the deposit a non-issue in court however this would not mean you would cease being liable for potential fines if the tenant received good advice about you not prescribing the information in the first place so really, to maintain all your rights and ensure you are not liable for fines, it's incredibly important to get all your admin points straight at the start of the tenancy. Now a quick point on prescribed information. In this webinar we talk about prescribed information as a deposit certificate and the information you need to send the tenant at the start of their tenancy about the deposit. Prescribed information is also a term used for sending the gas safety, how to rent booklet, EPC and a fully signed copy of the tenancy agreement to the tenant. Failure to send these documents can also affect your Section 21 rights, although there is no strict requirement on the timelines for these additional documents. So although in this webinar we talk about the prescribed information with regards to deposits, this information is required and it's a good idea to just send it all at once to the tenant. At Urban we also get the tenant to sign a document saying they have received all these documents just to cover ourselves and our landlords. Right, well that's it for today's session. Susie, thank you very much for your time. Tonight, we really appreciate you sharing your extensive knowledge and experience with us. A bit more about Urban, we are the UK's best online letting agent and what sets us apart is ensuring the landlord is getting the right tenant, not just any tenant, and is fully protected with legislation points, whether you choose to have us complete the tenancy or not. So please do check out our website, urban.co.uk. In a couple of weeks we have part two of the deposit series where Susie will be joining us again to talk about the dispute procedure. So thanks for joining us and we hope to see you next time.